Welcome back to our sign part video series. In this video, we will be covering how to load the material and the cutting tool into the lathe in preparation for cutting our first workpiece. The first step is going to be looking at what size raw material stock we require for making our part. Based on that, we'll start with the part drawing, from which we can determine that the final outside diameter of the part is approximately two inches, and the finished length of the part is approximately one and a half inches. Now let's talk about the length of stock required to safely manufacture this part using an engine lathe. For starters, we need enough material to manufacture the part itself, which in this case is one and a half inches. We also need enough material to safely clamp the raw stock in the jaws of the lathe chuck. The minimum amount to achieve this is typically one half the raw stock diameter or in this case, roughly one inch in length. Next, we need to allow adequate clearance between the cutting tool and the rotating chuck jaws to make sure we don't come too close during the actual machining process. Typically, one half inch is adequate for this clearance and as we gain more experience on the machine, we can reduce this clearance distance. Finally, we need to leave a little extra material for finishing the two faces of our part as well as the material that will be lost when cutting the excess stock off of our workpiece. To be conservative, we're going to allow an extra half inch of material. This brings our total raw stock part blank length to approximately three and a half inches. Now that we have an idea of the diameter and approximate length of the material blank that we need for our workpiece, we can talk about raw material stock. When you buy material from a material supplier, it comes in a pretty long length, typically eight or 10 feet, or up to 24 or 26 feet in length, so that you can buy, buy material that costs less per unit volume. The material rack that we have in the lab is pretty representative of some of the common materials that you'll use in industry. We have flat bars, round rods, and other types of geometric shapes like angles and um, channels. For our, for our work today, we need a piece of aluminum bar stock that is two inches in diameter. In this case, material, when we buy it and it is imperial, meaning the units are in inches, um, the diameters change. Uh, the resolution is in quarter of an inch increments. So you can order material that's an inch in diameter or an inch and a quarter, but to get something in between is very unusual. So we have to find the closest size from which we can make our part. As we discussed, two inch stock will be appropriate for us, so we need to take a piece off the shelf and cut it to the approximate length we discussed previously. At this point, we need to make a mark at approximately three and a half inches on our raw material stock in preparation to cut off our workpiece blank on the bandsaw. Now that we've marked up our part, we're ready to load it into the lathe chuck. To do so, we first need to talk about the speed range selector handle. On uh, the engine lathes we find in the lab, they have two speed ranges, low for lower spindle speeds, up to about 400 RPM. And the high range is from, allows the workpiece in the chuck to spin somewhere anywhere between 400 and 2500 RPM. We'll talk more about selecting the appropriate speed based on what we're doing on the machine in the, uh, in the future video series. But for now, we need to talk about how to put the machine in neutral so that we can safely load the workpiece without any risk of the, the, the spindle and chuck rotating if, for instance, we accidentally bump the power switch during this activity. Okay. The, uh, the, the, the selector handle has um, three, um, three locations. To the right, as you see it now, is high range. To the left is low range. And in the middle is neutral. When we have it in neutral, we can easily rotate the chuck by hand to identify, to locate what we call the chuck um, pinion gear. That is what engages the lathe chuck key. And if you remember back to the first safety video we, we, watched, we asked you to watch, the, um, the most important safety rule about the lathe focuses on this tool, on the lathe chuck key. And that rule said anytime that we have the chuck key in the chuck, you never want to, we, never, we never want to take our hands off it, okay, even for a second. So the entire time you're using it, keep your hand on it. If you need to do something else, take it out, put it down, or take it with you, we don't care. 
Okay, but never take your hand off the chuck key when you're, when you're using it because the risk is very high. If you do so, you could forget and accidentally turn the machine on and cause a very severe accident to yourself or to um, a coworker. Okay. In this case, we're gonna use the chuck key to open the jaws large enough so that we can insert our workpiece. I have the line shown uh, that, the, that demarks the clamping region of the part. So I'm going to close the chuck and I'm gonna use both hands on, the, on the, uh, the chuck key to apply about 30 pounds of force so that it's clamped nice and securely in the chuck jaws. Now let's talk about loading the cutting tool. The cutting tool has two components, the insert that is easily replaceable and the tool holder itself. The insert is made of tungsten carbide, which if you remember from homework one has similar properties to ceramic. It's very hard and heat resistant, so it works well as a cutting tool material. The tool holder itself is made of alloy steel and it allows the insert to be placed inside it, clamped down, and then the entire tool holder can be quickly installed onto the tool post. The tool post has a movable wedge and as I pull the handle back towards me, it secures the tool holder onto the tool post in preparation for metal cutting. When setting the vertical center height of the cutting edge, the goal is to make sure that the cutting edge is exactly on the center line of the spindle and not too low or too high. In the laboratory, there are two methods we use to easily check and set the vertical center line of the cutting tool. The first is to use a simple six inch scale that has a piece of rubber glued to the back of it and the second is to use a dedicated tool that we've made that has a bubble level on the top of it that is going to indicate when the tool is at the correct height. Now we'll show the proper use of each of these instruments. To use the six inch rule to check the vertical center height of the cutting edge, we gently pinch the ruler between the outside diameter of the workpiece and the cutting tip and evaluate the angle that the ruler makes with respect to a vertical reference. In this case, we can tell that the cutting tip is below the center line of the spindle or the workpiece because of the direction that the top of the, the, the ruler is tilted away from the part. If I retract the tool and raise it and repeat our test using the ruler, now we can tell that the cutting height of the tool tip is, is high with respect to the center line of the workpiece because the ruler, the top of the ruler, is tilted away from our vertical center line. If I retract the tool and lower it, we can iterate a couple times until we find the true vertical center. We bring the ruler back in, and gently pinch it, and now the ruler should be close to vertical indicating that the center height of the cutting tool is aligned with the center line of the spindle or the rotating workpiece. Another method for checking and setting the vertical center line of the cutting tool is to use a height gauge. Half the height gauge contacts the workpiece and the other half of the height gauge contacts the top of the cutting tool. The top of the height gauge has a bubble level that indicates when the two are in alignment with each other. If I put the height gauge into position, and I contact the top of the cutting tool and we watch the bubble in the top of the height gauge, we can see the bubble move as the tool height changes from too high to too low. And the height gauge makes it very easy to find the appropriate height at which the bubble is exactly in the middle of the gauge. The second check we want to make anytime we load a new cutting tool onto the tool post is the cutting tool relief angles. To adjust these, we loosen the nut on top of the tool post and that allows us to rotate the tool post and therefore the cutting tool in any orientation we desire with respect to the rotating workpiece. The goal when setting the cutting tool relief angles is to allow only the tip or the corner of the cutting edge to perform the cutting and the rest of the cutting edge to have a relief angle or clearance angle. As seen in the accompanying images, the cutting tool relief angle must be properly set for both the turning and facing orientations of the cutting tool.
Now that we've covered how to load the workpiece and the cutting tool, let's talk about the three-step process we'll follow every time we turn the lathe on. The first step before turning on the lathe is to check the clearance between the cutting tool and the rotating jaws. We do this by moving the cutting tool over to the first line we made on the workpiece, denoting the end of the finished part, putting the machine in neutral, and then slowly rotating the chuck through one revolution to make sure that there's adequate clearance between the cutting tool and the rotating chuck jaws. The second step before turning on the lathe is to select the appropriate spindle speed range. To the left, we have low range, which provides speeds between 20 and 400 RPM and provides high torques for when we're working with larger work pieces or difficult to machine materials. To the right, we have high range, providing a spindle speed selection between 400 and 2500 RPM. This is for working with materials that are easier to machine or smaller in diameter. The third step before turning on the lathe is to properly activate the power switch. The power switch is the long silver lever located on the right hand side of the carriage. It's activated by moving it to your right and down, which causes the chuck to rotate in the forward or counterclockwise direction. To turn the machine off, we grab the power switch with a firm hand, we lift it up slowly, and it has a spring-loaded detent that is going to automatically engage the neutral or off position. After turning the lathe on, we can adjust the spindle speed within the, the selected speed range by using the adjustment dial located on top of the headstock. As we adjust the dial, we'll see the updated speed displayed on the machine tachometer.